Good afternoon. I'm joined today by Steve Powis, Medical Director of the NHS, and Angela McLean, Deputy Chief Government Scientific Advisor. Let me start by reminding everyone about our step-by-step -step action plan to defeat coronavirus. At every step of this process, we have followed the latest scientific and medical advice. Our goal is to slow the spread of the virus and protect the ability of the NHS to cope. We've taken unprecedented action to increase NHS capacity with more beds, more staff and more equipment on the front line. And we've told people to stay at home so that we can protect lives and protect the NHS. Today's daily figures show that 232,708 people in the UK have now been tested for coronavirus. 60,734 people have tested positive, an increase of 5,492 cases since yesterday. 19,438 people have been admitted to hospital, and sadly of those in hospital, 7,097 have now died, an increase of 938 fatalities since yesterday. Our thoughts are with the family and friends of those who have passed away. People I'm sure will also want an update on the Prime Minister's health. He is receiving excellent care from the NHS team at St Thomas's. The latest from the hospital is that the Prime Minister remains in intensive care, where his condition is improving. I can also tell you that he has been sitting up in bed and engaging positively with the clinical team. The Prime Minister is not only my colleague and my boss, but also my friend, and my thoughts are with him and his family. The news about the PM reminds us how indiscriminate this disease is. Nearly everyone will know someone who's been affected. Friends, family, neighbours, colleagues. This is a terrible virus that respects no boundaries of status or geography or vocation. But we are not facing it alone. We are all taking part in a collective national effort to protect the vulnerable and each other, to secure our public services and to save lives. This endeavour is underpinned by an important, simple idea that we depend on each other. When you need it, when you fall on hard times, we will all, as one society, be there for you. To take care of you until you are once again ready to take care of yourself and others. This idea has been central to all of our efforts to support people and businesses during this crisis. We promise to do whatever it takes, and I am striving every day to keep that promise. But when I say we all depend on each other, I don't just mean the relationship between individuals, businesses, and the state. One of our greatest strengths as a country is our civil society. The local charities who provide so much compassion, care, and community to the most vulnerable in our country. You have not been forgotten. British people, businesses, and foundations are already doing their part to support our charity sector. And today, we in government will do our part as we build on our plan for the economy with a plan to support our social fabric. There are nearly 170,000 charities in this country, and the truth is we will not be able to match every pound of funding that they would have received this year. Charities can already use many of our existing schemes to support people and to protect their staff. All charities are eligible for the job retention scheme and in line with medical advice and just like any other employer, the right answer for many charities will be to furlough their employees. But some charities are on the front line of fighting the coronavirus and others provide critical services and support to vulnerable people and communities. For them, shutting up shop at this moment would be to contravene their very purpose, their entire reason to exist. Those charities have never been more needed than they are now, 
and they've never faced such a sudden fall in their funding. So today I'm announcing £750 million of funding for the charity sector. £370 million of that funding will support small, local charities working with vulnerable people. We all know who they are. Those small charities in our villages, our market towns, in pockets of our cities. The unsung heroes looking after the vulnerable and holding together our social fabric. In England, this support will be provided through organisations like the National Lottery Communities Fund. And we will allocate £60 million of this funding through the Barnet formula to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. The UK Government will also provide £360 million directly to charities providing essential services and supporting vulnerable people as we battle the coronavirus. Up to £200 million of those grants will support hospices, with the rest going to organisations like St John's Ambulance and the Citizens Advice Bureau, as well as charities supporting vulnerable children, victims of domestic abuse or disabled people. And last night, the BBC announced their Big Night In charity appeal on April the 23rd. And today I can confirm that the government will match pound for pound whatever the public decides to donate, starting with at least £20 million to the National Emergencies Trust appeal. Two short weeks ago, I spoke of the need for kindness, decency and the sort of neighbourliness that is at the heart of these charitable and community efforts. The normally invisible connections between us have, in recent weeks, become more apparent. For most of us, we spend our lives oblivious to these connections, these bonds, and how our behaviours, however small, can have a dramatic effect on others. But these bonds are not invisible for our local charities. For the volunteer keeping victims of domestic violence safe. For the outreach worker helping a rough sleeper find a bed. Or for the support worker manning the phones to help stave off the heart-wrenching loneliness so many of our elderly relatives and friends will be experiencing right now. These connections might be hard to see, but they are there, and they are strengthened by our compassion for others. Charities embody this like no other organisation. And their lesson is that the simplest acts have the potential to change lives. At this time, when many are hurting and tired and confined, we need the gentleness of charities in our lives. It gives us hope, it makes us stronger, and it reminds us we depend on each other. Thank you. If we could now uh, take some questions, I believe. Angela, were you going to present your slides first? If I may. Perfect. I wanted to start by showing this data, which is a record of, of how much uh, we've acted together to reduce how much we contact each other. So what's shown here is footfall at 17 stations across the, st across the country, uh, counting how many people pass through those stations at different times uh, through the month of March. And what you see is that at the end of March, footfall was down 94% compared to the first week of March. And in the next slide, what you can see is that that has worked in the sense that this count of new cases in the UK day by day over the last few weeks is not accelerating out of control. Yesterday, there were 5,492 new cases, and the spread of this virus is not accelerating, and that is good news. If I could have the next slide, please. What's recorded here is people in hospital beds with COVID. Uh, and the highest of those lines is London, and the one just below in grey is the Midlands. And what this is, 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 a, is a slower responding um, record of new infections because, of course, once people are in hospital, some of them will have to stay there uh, for many days, some of them for some weeks. 
But again, what we see is that the rate at which this is rising is definitely getting slower, and it looks like we're beginning to get towards a, a flat curve there, which is, of course, what we've all wanted. Our overall aim has always been to make sure that everybody can have access to critical care if they need it. And that's what's shown on the next slide, is COVID patients in critical care. Back one, please. Can I go back one, please? Mm. No? OK. This one here. Yes, thank you. And there uh, we can see encouraging news that perhaps, in, at least in some parts of the country, this really has started to flatten. Across the country, in the last 24 hours, this has increased by just 4%. Uh, and again, that is good news because this is our, our, our most limiting resource at the moment. So finally, I have data on the sad statistic about, of people who have died from COVID. And this is an international comparison across different countries showing how that number accumulates in different countries. And the UK is the dark blue line somewhere in the middle there. This data has long reporting lags. And even after the number of people in critical care stabilizes or even maybe begins to fall, this number will rise because sometimes deaths are reported many, many days or even a week or so after, sadly, somebody has died. So we expect this number to keep rising even after uh, the curve has flattened. Thank you, Chancellor. Thank you. Steve, anything you wanted to add? Well, maybe a word on charities. Um, so in the NHS, we work very closely with our partners in the charitable section. Uh, and I know it's really important that not only we all support them during this difficult time, but it's also really important to recognise the support that they are giving uh, everybody uh, to help them uh, through uh, the time where we are asking people uh, to stay at home and, and uh, take the measures that we have uh, indicated. Uh, I have the real privilege at NHS England of, of leading the cardiovascular, that's heart attacks and stroke strategy, and two charities I work very closely with, the British Heart Foundation and the Stroke Association. And I know they would want me to say today, uh, to remind everybody uh, that the NHS has worked night and day to surge capacity to manage uh, coronavirus, but it is also there for you if you have symptoms of a stroke, symptoms of a heart attack. Indeed, if you have any emergency condition, whether it's a sick child, uh, whether it's a mother uh, or a pregnant uh, mother in, in pregnancy who's worried about the movements of the baby, uh, you should be seeking emergency uh, services uh, just as you always have done. They are there for you. Uh, and although we are focusing on coronavirus, it's important that we also continue to focus uh, on uh, other uh, emergency conditions. Thank you, Steve. If we take some questions, I think first up is Laura Koonsberg from BBC. Um, thank you, Chancellor. Um, you keep saying whatever it takes to help people um, through this time and with support from the economy. But do you accept, Chancellor, that under the lockdown there is a trade-off between protecting people's health and protecting people's jobs? Thanks, Laura. Well, I think we've been clear our priority is to protect people's lives, their health and well-being. That is our absolute overriding priority. Uh, but alongside that, in a coordinated, I think, coherent and consistent fashion, we have also put in place unprecedented and significant measures to protect people's jobs, their incomes, their livelihoods and indeed the businesses that employ them. Uh, I think that's the right approach. And what it does is means that we can mitigate as much of the economic impact as possible and ensure that as soon as we can get through this, that we can bounce back as quickly as possible. Was there anything you that? wanted to follow up on for either of yeah. anyone else? Um, I mean, do you accept, though, that some people are falling through the cracks? I mean, the Treasury Select Committee this afternoon has said that you need to take urgent action for some people who aren't covered by your very extensive scheme. Do you think the public should be prepared for a serious downturn, maybe even a recession? I, I think I've, I've been very clear and very honest that 
this will have a significant impact on our economy. That's not uncommon with every other major uh, country that's grappling with this. I mean, we will all see a significant impact on our economy. And I've also been very honest that in spite of what are unprecedented measures in scale and scope, you know, I can't uh, stand here and say that I can save every single job, protect every single business, or indeed every single charity, uh, the focus of today's announcements. That's just simply not possible. But what we can do is put in place what I think is an enormous amount of support in a targeted fashion as best as possible to help as many people as possible get through this so that, as I said, we can emerge on the other side of it, stronger, united, and hopefully able to bounce back as quickly as possible. Perfect. I think if we uh, turn next to, is it Tom Clark from ITV? Tom, are you there? Uh, hello, yes, I am. Thank you, Chancellor. My question relates to testing. Uh, yesterday's uh, briefing of the chief medical officer made the honest um, admission that Germany's lower death toll in their pandemic is due to their ability to test more people more quickly. Given their death toll is three times, high, more than three, three times lower than ours, is it now time for the government to come out and admit that thousands of people have died and thousands more people will die in this country as a result of our failure to test more people more rapidly. Steve, to, uh, to be honest, I don't think that's what the chief medical officer did say. I think he said that testing was many, one of many factors, and I think the chief scientific advisor spoke about this too, was one of a range of things uh, in Germany, and I think it's difficult uh, at this stage to say uh, what range of uh, factors uh, has contributed to what. I think the chief medical officer was also making clear uh, that it's important that all countries learn from each other. Uh, and I've no doubt that other countries will want to learn from uh, our experience and some of the things that we have done uh, in, uh, in the United Kingdom, for instance, the work uh, on modelling and predicting uh, what the epidemic might do. So I think the point he was making yesterday uh, was that everybody should be learning from each other. And indeed, that is uh, what we're doing. A Angela might have more to say on that. Yes, I would have thought the point would be that the, the, the rate of deaths, of course, appears much lower if you can count many, many more of the cases. That's certainly one of the things that you see. If, if you see different case fatality rates in countries, uh, that could be because you're counting many, many more of the people who should be on the bottom of that fraction. Um, in terms of modelling, that is something that we're uh, really very happy in this country to offer to other countries and hope that's one of the things we can contribute to the international effort. Great. Thank you. Tom, I hope, does that, I hope that... As you, you, like you, you, I just sat through the uh, select committee hearing uh, on which you were a witness. Uh, we heard from the people in charge of testing in South Korea and in Hong Kong, uh, who made it abundantly clear testing has reduced the numbers of cases of coronavirus in those countries. And Mr. Whitty, Dr. Whitty did say yesterday that it was in fact Germany's ability to test the, that it, it was yes, part of their lower death uh, rates, and that we had less certainty. He did not dispute that. It is about mm -hmm. testing. So can you tell me whether it, our inability to test will lead to greater mortality here? And can I also follow up? How dependent is the UK on a testing regime for us to be able to lift lockdown restrictions? And are we on course to have the sufficient levels of testing in the community to allow us to do that in anything like uh, the next three or four weeks? So, so I think we all agree that testing is important. That is not the issue at all. Uh, I think the point I was making is that testing is one part of a set of different things uh, that will need to be considered in any country's uh, strategy. Uh, that is the case here. It is the case in Germany. And I have spoken to Chief Medical Officer today, and I think, uh, well, I know the point he was making yesterday uh, was it, it, is, it, it is a part of the overall strategy. Uh, and I think it is almost certainly too early in all countries' experience uh, to know exactly which components of strategies have uh, been the most effective or have been most important. And it's highly likely it's the combination of these things rather than one, any individual part of uh, an approach. Brilliant. Thank you, Tom. Uh, can we turn to Andy Bell from Channel 5? Yes, thank you. And I want to follow up partly on Tom's question about the lockdown, but in a different context, which is the First Minister of Wales has said today that, as far as he's concerned, the lockdown is going to continue beyond next week in Wales. So can you level with us now and, and just accept that the lockdown is going to continue uh, across the UK uh, through next week and from a scientific and medical point of view is it 
possible or even desirable that different parts of the country could come out of lockdown at, at different speeds? Yeah, let me, let me address that before handing, uh, handing over, Andy. I can just say look, there will be a COBRA meeting tomorrow chaired by the First Secretary of State it, involving the devolved um, administrations to talk about, uh, talk about the approach to the review. We committed that there would be a review um, uh, on, in and around three weeks. That review will be based on the uh, evidence and the data provided by SAGE, which will only be available next week. But I think rather than speculate about the future, I think we should focus very seriously on the here and now and the present. And I think there the message is unequivocal. Our priority right now is to stop the spread of this virus, to get the, the other side of the peak. And the best way to do that is for people to follow the advice, which is to stay at home protect lives and protect the NHS. So I think in terms of messaging, I would want to be absolutely unequivocal about that. That's where we are now. That's the advice people should be following. That's the best thing that we can all do to help get through this as quickly as possible. Um, but I don't know, Andrew, if you wanted to add anything on that. We have always said that uh, we would need to be able to see what impact the whole suite of interventions that were brought into place on the 23rd of March are having before we can make any evidence-based decision on what to do next. And this week is, an, is a really important week. We're all watching what happens. Um, I guess from a purely scientific point of view, uh, more data is better for us. But I completely agree with the Chancellor that what really matters is that people stay home, protect lives, and save the NHS, or is it the other way around? Brilliant. Andy Hope, does that answer your question? Um, I'd just like to come back to the idea of whether different parts of the country could theoretically emerge at different times from lockdown, whether that's, first of all, politically possible, and secondly, whether that's in any way scientifically or medically desirable. I, I think that what I'd probably say before handing over to, to Angela on the medical is just, I think, again, I don't want to start speculating about the future. I think that's not helpful at this juncture. I think the thing now is for people to focus unequivocally on the advice. We, you know, where we are where we are in this process, and the advice is clear. People should follow the advice. That's the best thing that everyone can do wherever they live uh, in this country at the moment. And I, I think Angela probably would echo that. But. I, I would echo that. Um, I, I don't want to get into hypotheticals about what might be better uh, one way or another. Um, I, I suspect that simple strategies might well turn out to be the best to use, but we'll see. And I'm going to get it right this time. The advice is for Easter weekend to stay home protect the NHS and save lives. So I will certainly be having uh, my Easter at home. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Gary Gibbon from Channel 4. Thank, Thank you. you. Chancellor, can I ask you, we've had unemployment figures from one European country so far post-COVID crisis, Norway, unemployment well over 10%. From the data you look at in the Treasury, can you hand on heart say we're not going to see something like that here? No, Gary, I, I will be absolutely honest. This will have a significant impact on our economy and not in an abstract way. It will have an impact on people's jobs and their livelihoods. And that's why we've taken the actions that we have uh, in order to help mitigate some of that. I believe that, for example, the jobs retention scheme, the furlough scheme that we've put in place, which we've never had anything like in this country, as I said when I stood here, to announce it, you know, the government is stepping in to help people, to help pay people's wages so that they're not laid off, so they don't end up being unemployed, that they remain attached to their company, um, you know, with a, a very significant safety net behind them. That helps the company, that helps the person, it helps their family finances. Uh, I think that, and, and to combine with all the other measures we've taken, will significantly um, help mitigate some of the impact. And I think that's what other commentators have said uh, as well, that if we weren't doing uh, all the things that we're doing. If we weren't put in place these unprecedented measures, it, it would certainly be worse. So I believe we're doing the right things. I, I, can't, I can't stand here and say that there isn't going to be hardship ahead. It, there is, uh, which is why going through this together as one society united, understanding that everyone's got a role to play, whether that's government, business, charities, um, you know, your next door neighbour, I think that's the best approach to this. And I, but I'm confident we will get through it. Can I ask, is, is some of that... Uh... Is some of the data from surveys already coming in outstripping your expectations? You mentioned the furlough scheme, some suggestion that there could be people applying for that, businesses applying for that way in excess maybe of Treasury expectations. Did you ever think 
you could be forking out, say, 40 billion over three months, which could be the number, couldn't it? Well, I, I think just to clarify on that, we have not put out a specific projection or an, or an estimate of the take up of that scheme. And I think there was some reporting that we might have, and this might be an excess of it. So we haven't actually done that for the simple reason is, you know, I, I, this is an unprecedented situation. So of course, we have a range of scenarios that we that might uh, come a lot away, but there isn't a precise central estimate of, of what the scheme might do. You know, what, what I what I would say is you're right, there is other data that we can look at. And I think others and myself have talked about universal credit claims, which have come down from where they were you know, 10 days ago, which is comforting, but they're still very elevated relative to what normal levels might be, sometimes four or five times higher, you know, that is obviously, uh, you know, that is obviously something we look at. And that's why we've not only strengthened the safety net and put extra uh, money to the tune of £7 billion plus into the welfare system for those who are accessing universal credit, we've also provided more funding to DWP, for example, to help them you know, process those claims and make sure people get the support as quickly uh, as they need. But I said, when it comes to the job retention scheme, you know, people who are put on that scheme uh, at, at whatever scale it is, to me, that's the scheme working. The idea is that we did that so that people were not laid off, they were not unemployed, they had a good income to get them through this, and they remain attached to their company and their employer. So you know, it, if it ends up being significantly used, you know, I will view that as a success if it means that we get through this and then can bounce back quickly and provide security to those people and their families during it. Thank you. Is, um, I think, next Pippa Creer at the Daily Mirror? Um, we all know that the focus now, um, the focus now is currently on following the advice rightly. Um, but I've spoken to head teachers and parents and MPs who are very keen to reopen schools as soon as the scientific advice suggests that it's safe to do so. So could I ask Professor McLean um, whether despite the focus um, on the advice now, whether she could give us any indication of whether schools might reopen before the summer holidays, which after all are three months away. And the Chancellor, if I could ask you, how significant a factor are schools in your discussions about getting the economy back on its feet once we're through the other side of this? I'm happy to answer that by saying there's very intensive work going on to think about all sorts of different things that we might do in the next stage. It would be completely premature for me to give a, a, a yes or no answer to that question because so much depends on this question of how well have the measures put in on March the 23rd worked and we can't know that this week uh, and, and until we see a longer run of infections that have happened since that time. But please be assured that people are working incredibly hard to explore those sorts of questions. Yeah, and, and Pippa, I probably can't add much to um, what Angela said, is that you know, we are, in all these instances, we are driven uh, and basing our decisions on the science uh, and what is best for controlling the spread of this virus and getting that uh, R0 number down. Uh, that's been our approach to this thing all along, and that will continue to be our approach. And I, you know, I pay tribute to those who are helping keep our schools open for the children of key workers. That is, that is valuable. And the work that they're doing is, um, you know, I believe, well supported by the Department of Education. But again, they also are owed our thanks for, for doing that, because that is vital at this time. I can, can I come back? Yeah, of course, um, yes. I, I, um, I mean, I can understand that, you, that obviously the data and the science suggests that it's too soon to say. Um, but Mr. Paris was talking just days ago about green shoots and uh, the beginnings of signs of the curve flattening. Was that premature? No, I don't think so, because I think what I said last week was that the green shoots were occurring in some of the early things that we were seeing, such as the reduction in, in transport, the reduction in footfall that we uh, describe in these uh, press conferences, uh, which recognises that uh, the British public is complying with instructions and as we've said the message is we need to continue complying with those instructions on social distancing. So, so those green shoots over time uh, translate into benefit in, in a reduction in the number of infections, a reduction in the number of hospitalizations and then sadly finally into a reduction in the number of deaths. And I think as you have uh, heard from Angela uh, at the start of this press conference we are starting to see 
a plateauing, the first signs of a plateauing of, of infections and hospitalizations. And, and if we had not taken those measures, if people had not complied with them, we would not be seeing that. We would be seeing an exponential curve and a set of graphs that were steeply rising. Uh, so uh, it's, it is, we are beginning to see the benefits, I believe, but the really critical thing is that we have to continue following instructions. We have to continue following social distancing because if we don't, the virus will start to spread again. And if it starts to spread again, then in a week or two's time, we will be seeing a set of figures which are not going in the direction that we want to see them. We will see increased pressure on the NHS. We will see increased numbers of deaths. So this is not the time to become complacent. It's not the time to think that the job has been done. This is the time to continue everybody continuing, whether, whether you're me, whether you're a member of the public, frankly, whether you're a football team, to continue to keep with social distancing and ensure that the hard work and the, the hardship that, we've, that, we are, that everybody is no doubt encountering leads to those benefits. Um, that's a simple message today, and you've heard it time and time again, and there are no apologies for giving it. Brilliant. Thank you, Pippa. Could we uh, go next to, is it M Mesa Hall from The Express? Oh, no. Uh, yes, th thank you, Chancellor. Um, just back to your job retention scheme, the Head of Revenue and, and Customs has today warned that the scheme is open to fraud and abuse. Is, have you had any evidence that that is happening? And would you urge employees to blow the whistle on firms that may be abusing this scheme? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, look, I... Um, what I would say is we're obviously designing schemes at pace, which haven't been done before. And part of the reason that we've made some of the decisions that we've made in the design, of whether it's the job retention scheme or the self-employed, are deliberately to counter fraud. Because obviously we want to make them as simple as possible and as accessible to as many people as possible whilst protecting the taxpayer, because ultimately this is all of our money that will need to be paid back at some point. So we want to make sure it's targeted on people who really need it. Uh, and that has actually influenced some of the design choices we've made that, that, you know, that means some people might fall between the cracks. It means that there are people who are saying, well, can you not do it this way? Can you include us? And, and the reason you know, we've not been able to do that is to protect against exactly that. Um, you know, exactly the risk of fraud or spurious claims that we won't be able to verify or only verify with a very cumbersome manual process which would delay the scheme's implementation, which I think is not the right thing. So, you know, I'm confident that the decisions we've made will minimise the risk of fraud. Uh, obviously, you know, the, the team are hard at work at the moment getting these schemes up and running and we will have as robust verification and auditing processes as possible uh, to ensure that there isn't fraud uh, and that we can go and tackle it. But, you know, we, that's why we've made some of the choices we've made and hopefully that, you know, w w people will understand that and they hopefully have been reasonable about that when I've explained, well, this is why you had to be employed, for example, on this particular day. Because uh, if you weren't, then obviously there is the risk that you could create a brand new uh, employment for someone who we've never heard of before and suddenly start getting money from the taxpayer payer for, for not a, a genuine case. And so that's, for example, one of the reasons we picked a, a cutoff date of February the 28th for the, that particular scheme. A big part of that was preventing fraud. So, um, you know, hopefully that's clear. And, and Jim and the HMRC and his team are doing a fantastic job getting these things up and running. I think he talked a little bit about timing and we're on track to deliver against the uh, timelines that I outlined earlier, which is pleasing because this is a, a, you know, this is a huge challenge for them and they're doing a great job. I hope that, does that answer what you wanted? Thank you. Thank you. Perfect, thank you. Um, James Tapsfield, May Mail Online. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, Churchill had a personal doctor and President Trump has a medical team, but the Prime Minister was left with persistent symptoms for over a week and was only admitted to hospital after a video call with a GP. There doesn't seem to have been a great deal of social distancing going on in Downing Street. Uh, haven't we failed to protect our key decision makers? And what needs to change for the future? Should we be more of a US style system with more protection? Well, I think I'll, I'll defer to Steve in a second, but I would say that I think the Prime Minister has received excellent care and advice uh, at every step of the process. At the end of the day, no matter you know, we're all trying our absolute best that you know, none of us are superhuman uh, and impervious to getting sick during this process. And that's what makes this whole thing uh, so awful for all of us. Uh, but, uh, you know, as I've observed and seen, the advice, the care has been excellent, uh, not just beforehand, but especially now uh, at St Thomas's. I don't know, Steve, there's anything you want yes, to I'm add? I'm absolutely particular? confident the Prime Minister has, re is, has and is receiving excellent uh, medical care. Uh, I'm not his uh, physician. Uh, he he uh, will have been um, advised by 
by uh, his own doctors, but I do know colleagues at St. Thomas's Hospital. Uh, in fact, a couple of weeks ago, I took the opportunity to visit uh, St. Thomas's Hospital, visit some of the critical care consultants, and I can't tell you how impressed I was uh, and this is going back a few weeks at the preparations that they were making, the details uh, that they were thinking through in terms of how they would deal with uh, uh, an increase in patients with coronavirus. Uh, they are amongst the best critical care clinicians in the world. St Thomas's, even when I was a junior doctor many years ago, uh, was world renowned for its critical care uh, capacity. So I'm absolutely confident, absolutely confident uh, that my colleagues, all the clinical staff, doctors, nurses, and everybody else at St. Thomas's is, is providing uh, exceptional world-class care. Brilliant. Thank you, Steve. Uh, does that answer your question? I was just going to say, the point on the Downing Street social distancing, in hindsight, do you think that that could have been more rigorously observed earlier? Well, I think, look, everyone is doing their, their best to follow the guidelines. I mean, you know, whether it's, you know, Cabinet, we've conducted, I think, for the first ever time, meetings, um, you know, via alternative means, and, and people are appropriately following all the guidance. You know, that doesn't mean that we can completely eliminate the spread of infection in this process. But I, I think the good news is, as I said, there's, there's good update on the Prime Minister's condition. You know, those that have been uh, away are uh, many of them now returning to work. But I think whether people are away or, or social distancing, or physically in the same place, you know, the business of government throughout all of this has gone on and it has gone on at pace. Uh, and the team, whether it's politicians, cabinet ministers, civil servants, doctors and medical advisors, you know, are working night and day to make sure that we do what we need to to get the country through this and support the British people at this time. I can absolutely give you that assurance. Uh, thank you. Can we um, do you turn to Tim Ross from Bloomberg? Tim, you there? Hello, yes. Uh, Chancellor, you say the Prime Minister is improving. Um, do you expect to see him able to leave hospital next week sometime? What are your expectations there? Um, also, on Brexit, Chancellor, you uh, have said before that you're very honest about the risks to the economy and the fact there will be a really significant impact, um, potentially a recession later this year. Do you really think it's a good idea to leave the European Union if the UK economy is in or just coming out of a very deep recession. And then to your two colleagues, uh, the decision on whether to persist with the lockdown measures will be taken, we think uh, you're saying next week, probably sometime. What will the full range of data that you're analyzing be uh, in order to take that decision? And are we at the beginning of the peak now? How far off is your best guess? Um, if, if I could start, I, I think, you know, on, you, you talked about, you know, should we still leave the European Union, I think. I mean, we, we have left the European Union. That has happened. Uh, what, you know, what we're doing now is just negotiating the final terms of our trading arrangements. Uh, that work is carrying on. And uh, David Frost, our, uh, the Prime Minister's Chief Sherpa in this regard, held talks earlier this week with the deputy counterpart over uh, at the EU. They've exchanged legal texts. They've set out um, uh, some clarifications that they both wanted from each other. Uh, and indeed, I think David is talking to his direct counterpart either later this week or next week um, to plan the next steps for the meetings and continue negotiations over April and May. So I think we remain committed to the timeline of concluding those uh, talks and negotiations. That work is happening, uh, you know, albeit over video conference rather than in person. Uh, so I you know, I think I think that's pretty clear statement of where we are on that. I think on the Angela, do you want to take the question on the? Yes, very very happy to take that question. So one of the great strengths of the kinds of mathematical modelling that Sage is drawing on in order to give its advice is that it lets you pull together information from all sorts of different data streams. So my colleagues who are generating that advice will be using hard data on things like numbers of people arriving at hospital, numbers of people having to be admitted to critical care in hospital, but also things like that data on how many people are there in stations, um, uh, survey data asking people, well, what, what behaviours, precisely what behaviours have you uh, toned down uh, in the last few weeks? Uh, so I, I could actually bore you by telling you how many different street data streams uh, are under consideration, but that is the strength of that approach, is it lets you Take, take a lot of different kinds of information and do the best job you can of synthesising them together in order to understand the situation we have been in in the past that has brought us to where we are now and then do what you can to 
uh, project into the future what's going to happen next. But I'm not going to do that right now, uh, because that's something that we do in a rather formal process. The modelers come to SAGE, and then SAGE puts that together, and we send it over uh, to, to our politicians in order to make decisions. Steve, anything you wanted to add no, finally? Uh, as you know, SAGE has been publishing uh, its material, so that is available. And I think also to add that many of the academic groups that contribute to SAGE public, publish their own uh, research and modelling independently. Uh, and so that is there for all uh, to see in terms of those key academic groups. Brilliant, thank you. Well, if I could um, possibly wrap up, thank you, uh, Tim, for, for that. Um, and just say thank you to Angela, thank you to Steve for answering all the questions. Uh, you know, our announcement today was about supporting charities who are a critical part of the social fabric of this country. Uh, it builds on the economic plan that we've already announced to protect people's health and economic security, by supporting public services like our NHS, backing business, and protecting people's jobs and incomes. And if I could conclude by saying this, our economic plan and the plan for charities that we announced today are built on one simple idea, that we depend on each other. Thank you. <laughs>